This week's episode is sponsored by Change. Change is an online mentoring program that teaches people with no experience how to create a real profitable online business and e-commerce. I have been working with Ryan at Change for a few years now and attended many events and got to meet the amazing community of like-minded people. These guys are the best of the best. The support these guys offer is personal, no bots or employees, there's no experience needed, but like anything in life, it takes time as it's a real business with real results. For more information, go check out Ryan on Instagram at RyanJB and he will guide you through the steps to help build a successful business. You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications bell so you're notified for when my next podcast goes live. From the age of 10, I started playing for Stockport Boys. And at Stockport Boys, I was obviously one of the best best players there. And uh, there was a scout there called Barry Bunnell. And my life changed from that moment, really. But it was pretty quick with me. It, it, the touching had start, and then it went on to the rape, and that was continuous. So I became numb to it. He told me at Butlins with the rest of the team, and he pulled me down a dark alley, and he told me, and he said, me and your sister are more than friends. If you say anything, I will kill you. And with everything else that he'd done to me, I believed that he would. So I didn't say anything to my parents. Because when you break, when you're a whistleblower, and you are a whistleblower in in the biggest sport in the world, it can have its consequences. Do you got fear for your own life? Yeah. Because it was says that she had bought poison and killed herself. Yeah. Do you believe there's a lot more to it? Yeah. It's all connected. And I said in t 2016, I said there's a ring, there's a paedophile ring in football, and lo and behold. They all come out. Chelsea, we used to go to the Norwich Cup, the Ipswich Cup, the Southampton Cup, the Celtic Cup. Gary, unfortunately, you know, he he was with Benel at the time, before me, you know, and I'm not, I, I can't sit here and say 100% that Gary took his life because of that. See, because yeah. of all the shit that you've been through and there is a connection yeah. of people getting abused and then going to, Go abuse on to be abusers, yes, yeah, Was yeah. Is that a concern in your mind? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then we're on, and today's guest we've got Andy Woodward, Amanda, and me. Nice. You good? Yeah, I'm all good. Frank, first and foremost, thanks for coming on the show. In 2016, you exposed a big scandal. Was it Barry Beno? That's right. You serial paedophile at that height yet? Was it 20 odd years that got in prison? Well, you got 36. 36 years? Yeah, man. yeah. That's a big sentence compared to some of the sentences, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. But you stood at the forefront and decided to come forward and expose that. I think there was a documentary about it. Is it Floodlights? Me, there's a film called Floodlights. Floodlights. Yeah, that, that was further on. Obviously, the last well, it's been in the last year that that came out. Mm -hmm. You've been through some darkness in your life, yeah. Um, and it t I've had a lot of survivors on who's spoken out, and it takes mass amount of strength. But even you sitting here today will bring people forward because there's there's nonsense everywhere, everywhere, every football team, every fucking dressing room that you go in, there'll be somebody there that and for people speaking out, it gives people strength, gives people hope. Mm. And that's why we're here today. But before we get into everything, I always like to go back to the start, I guess, where you grew up and how it all began. Yeah, I got, you know, I grew up in uh, Chile, Stockport. And um, throughout my young childhood, it was, you know, I had the most amazing parents, the most protective parents, because we'll go into it the link later on. But as a, as a young child, um, something significant happened to my mum's sister um, and a murder. And so they were overprotective. Um, 
to the point where I couldn't even go out the front really without them watching over me. Um, so, so throughout my childhood, from a young age, it was it was a delight really. Um, no issues, no problems. Mum and dad happily together. And then the age of ten, I'd always been mad about football. And then from the age of ten, I started playing for Stockport Boys. And at Stockport Boys, I was obviously one of the best best players there. And uh, there was a scout there called Barry Bunnell, and my life changed from that moment really. Because he says your abuse started from 11 years old. Yeah, that's right. Um, and <clears throat> obviously, since I know everything about his previous, you know, as we call MO, you know, his operations, the way that he did things, and he he picked me out and was building a team and went to my parents and said that could have come down training at Man City at Platte Lake, and I started training there, um, and within very short period of time and this is what his you know method was that he'd pick out the more vulnerable of players and he picked me and he said to my parents straight away within weeks really you know can he come and stay at my house it will encourage his career he's, he's a good player etc and my mum and dad you know asked me and you know with a 10 year old you, you're gonna go wow if he's gonna make me a footballer then yeah I'll go and stay there so that's where the abuse started. How much does that play in your mum and dad's mind, being overprotective and then yes. something as extreme as that happening? Because I had a woman, amazing woman on Sarah Sands. Mm -hmm. Old man, 77, sitting outside the shop. Yeah. I used to talk to everybody. She's fucking amazing man. Mm -hmm. She gave up. He wanted to give her son a job, paper job, who could boost his confidence and work in the back room. Fucking old bastard abused her son. Yeah. She killed him. Yeah. Killed him. Back in, you know, there's many that potentially you know that that would go to those lengths to do that because in terms of that from a from a very young age it it's a life sentence so I, you know I've, we'll go into it later but i've i've spoke to thousands of, and i mean thousands of people that in the last six and a half years that have all had a denominating thing that they've said is that this is a life sentence it's how you cope and deal with that because the actual trauma never goes away. And that defined moment from a sexual touch to any kind of abuse like that from a young age defines your life. And it's how you deal with that from that age. So that defining moment, that the moment that he touched me at the age of just under 11, is a defining moment that maps out your life. And it's, it's a life sentence. And that's the point where, as soon as he touched me, I look back on it now from all the experience and the therapy and everything else. That moment decided my life path. So see, when he does that then, and you stay with him, what, because you're so young, probably don't even know about sex education at that time. Yep. You're oblivious to everything, so you become numb to it. That I spoke to enough people now to understand that how they then become groomed and think, some people actually think it's okay. Some girls have had on women, amazing women, yeah. abused at seven, raped at seven. But then they end up, I wouldn't say it's like a, a relationship, but they feel bonded to that person. And in their mind, it's just mass manipulation. It's mass grooming where they do anything for their abuser. And that's the sad thing. Like, see, after the first time, you, the first day, mate, you get abused. Like, what were you like the next day? Did you understand what was happening? Or were you kind of numb to it? Um... It's, it's at that age, um, and I don't think it's, um, as a child, it, it is different because you, you don't understand, like say back then there was none of sex education and nothing like that. And it's, it's a case of when I think back to how I felt, I froze. And that freezing moment of that perpetrator as a child, whether you're a boy or a girl, that's the empowerment that they have and that power that they've got over you then that you've frozen and you've implicit to it is that's the starting block for them and when you've frozen you then you go within yourself and it's that's the point where this fear kicks in and that's the fear start and that's fear of that empowerment and the power they have over you on a sexual level, 
is the impact it has on you and you then just switch off. How does it then change everything in your life from young kid, footballer, just loving it, doing everything to be a footballer, to then how does that then mentally scar you playing football? Did your career die? Did your everything die? But were you just trying to block everything? But, yeah, what, I mean, what, what happens with that? And many players have already said that with that impact of that, as a young child, you you it's like anything, whether it's football or any sport or you know, the church or that empower that power they have over you. You want to do the right and in the church, in sport, in sport especially, is that your passion is to play football or whatever sport that is. And because they've got that power over you, you, you abide to what their rules and you just continue because that in one part of your brain it's that you want to succeed in what you've always wanted to do through your life even as a child but the other side that dark and horrible events that go on and the trauma from that you kind of try and put that out because the desire is so much to do the amazing thing that that is in football. Did your mum and dad notice any changes in you? When they've talked back, the the only thing that they could say to me was that I became more withdrawn and more quiet at home. Um, did they question me? He was that engulfed within my mum and dad, paying visits. He'd turn up every now and again and just say how well I was doing. Um, and in the film it shows, you know, he'd, he'd sit down and just say how amazing a player I was and how good I was. And so really, he'd, he'd, in, he'd, he'd intertwined with my mum and dad as kind of, a, not a family member, but a good friend as well. So they didn't, it was only obviously, you know, I spoke to him since and they said that obviously the guilt, but they, they couldn't see it back then because he'd, he'd groom them. Mm -hmm. But they couldn't accept that until I broke the story in 2016. So this went on for four or five years? Yeah, yeah. And still, and the same team still staying over and stuff? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I practically lived at his house. I was, I, I had time off school, you know, my education suffered and he used to ring up my mum and dad and say, oh, we've got this tournament or we've got this going on and we've got that going on. Is it all right if he stays? And my mum used to get on the phone, are you okay? inside me but his power that he was stood over me staring at me and that overrides over overrid that, that what he was doing to me that i'd always do the right thing because i was always a yes boy anyway isn't it mad that how they, they steal your power mm. they steal your thinking they steal everything, everything from you your soul that because the people who have had on who speak about it like they've just got so much power over them and that's the sad thing because kids they're innocent they're so innocent yeah. man and that's a fucking heartbreaking thing like i'd do anything for my i kill for my kids yeah. i'd be happy to do a life sentence to protect yeah. my kids no fucking with the yeah. blink of an eye like no it's easy done like yeah but so see when you're going through that then and staying over does it just become a normal thing like where you think it's just normal or for did the, it feel that, weird did it yeah feel strange? i mean for the first and he used to do it he did it he did it with me he'd only choose a certain two or with me unfortunately for after a short period there was two of us and the other boy stopped staying so i was on my own and because i was on my own i felt lost because at least with two of us it wasn't both of us all the time but then i was on my own and you kind of get numb to it because i was a piece of meat to him and at night time, initially, when it first started, and he'd go in stages, it, it wouldn't go to rape at the start, but it was pretty quick with me. It, it, the touching had start, and then it went on to the rape, and that was continuous. So I became numb to it. So at night time, it was, I knew what was going to happen, and it was like a sacrifice to continue playing football, because if I didn't, then he'd get rid of me and he'd use tactics like I did say no once on Christmas day 
and we were playing a game and he dropped me and he said to me don't do that again and that power then was i'm not going to be a footballer if i say no who's the other kid the other kid was um i can say it now because he's you know he's been public is in fact i have to be a bit careful yeah, with that's that. okay but does, does he is he came out also yeah he he did <laughs> Unbeknown to me in 97, when I did speak to the police, because unfortunately he married my sister and he, my nephew and niece, and my nephew was eight and he'd been arrested in Jacksonville. Um, I had a choice, career or I knew it was going to break me. Um, but I chose the break. But in 97, when I did speak to the police, unbeknown to me, this other player had spoke to the police and give evidence. But I didn't know that until 2016, he came again. And I do know who he is now. I know, uh, sorry, know that he'd done that in 97. Because the story's mad as well. It goes a lot deeper than just that, the connection with, what is it? Did he marry your sister? Mm. So how how did that become, how did that come about? The boy, the man who's abusing you uh, yeah. then marries your sister? But... So he had, he had a method that he'd do, and I know he, <clears throat> He also um, sexually assaulted other sisters before me, and that was that was a screen for him, smoke screen. But unfortunately for me, out of all his previous, he used to say to me, you, "You're you're not like anyone else I've had," and he used to say, "I love you," and literally, and he and it kind of came out that he meant it. But he got hold of my sister at four well, 13, 14, and she, he got her to clean his house, Hoover his house, and I'll pay you for it. And that was, again, he was that embroiled within the family that he told me at Butlins with the rest of the team, and he pulled me down a dark alley, and he told me, and he said, me and your sister are more than friends. If you say anything, I will kill you. And with everything else that he'd done to me, I believed that he would. So I didn't say anything to my parents because his power over me, he was raping me. Then he said that he'd kill me if I said anything. So I was locked in. So it was even worse for me because I knew that my sister, who was a year, 18 months older than me, and I was only 13, 12, 13, he'd got her. Sick bastard, didn't he? Yeah. So it wasn't just young boys, it was young girls as well. Yeah. That... Did you ever have the conversation with your sister? Then are we just too scared to no. say anything? No. Um, the only time that me and Linda have really spoke in depth about it is just last year when I brought the film out. Because when I broke the story, she was still in too much pain. And it was too much for her. So nobody knew until you came out? My my parents knew in 97 because when I broke to the police and I broke down in my mum's house, my sister obviously suspected because he'd been arrested, but he was still, he'd still have that. And, and the women will get this because the women that have been abused as a child and that control and power still stays there with them. And she couldn't accept that he was and I had not said a word that he'd done it to me until I spoke to the police in 97. When I did that, my sister broke down. She had a nervous breakdown. And my mum and dad had a breakdown because two of their kids had been abused by him. And they only found out then in 97. So your sister married them, though? Mm. How old was this? How old was he when you were 14, 15? What he... I was 13 when he told me. He then engaged in a relationship with her. And he he also, this is his mastermind, you see, because normally he'd let go of, from the age of 14 to 16, he would let any, any because he preferred younger kids. I was the only apprentice that he then took on because he knew he was with me and he knew he had my sister and he, he wanted long-term. So I ended up being 
he ended up being my manager as an apprentice from 16 to 18. So I couldn't get rid of the motherfucker. He, he stayed with me to make sure he still had that power over me because he wanted my sister as well as me. Yeah, it's mad. I had a guy called Jeff Thompson on that. Like, I know of, Jeff, yeah. One of the biggest killers on the planet. Like, he's an eighth dan. Yeah, like, unbelievable, know. man. Like, yeah. Um, and I he called he it is. the parasite. Mm. When he his instructor abused him when he was 11 mm. or 12, he talks about the hairy hand. And yeah. He just fueled himself with anger. He became a killer. Yeah. Then he always visualised in his mind that we would kill this man. And he's seen him. Mm. He's an eighth dan by this time. He's yeah. an old man. And when he seen him, he froze. Yep. He fucking froze. Yeah, I, I went to see Bunnell in prison <clears throat> and it's in the film as well. And do you know something? I was in the police then. I'd been in the police for a few years, felt empowered. I was, I was going for crew at the time. And I went in there and I sat opposite him, just like we are now. And he came with his T-shirt on and bottoms and he sat opposite me. And he said, hi, Andy. And he smiled and I went back into child mode. I felt 10 again instantly why did you want to go and see your abuser closure and no it was more and we'll go into it but the reason i went is because um at in 2003 i was good friends with a guy called peter morrison and he was he played for scunthorpe and he had his leg, leg snapped cut a long story short he told his solicitor about my what i'd been through and the solicitor ended up coming to see me and said, crew were liable for this. My head went, I can get crew for what they'd done to me because they were implicit in this. They, they'd they seen everything that had happened. And part of that, the, looking back now, why did I have to go to a prison and go and see him when a lawyer could have done that, but I was advised to go and see him to see if he'd give a statement for me. Why should I do that? That shouldn't be my responsibility, but I did it because I was in my head. It was, I can, I can expose this horrible secret. And I went to see him because I asked him to do a statement. He said he would, and lo and behold, he did a statement, but on Crew's behalf. So seeing you're 16, 17, 18, still playing under him, like, was he still abusing you? When was the last time last, you stopped? Last time. He abused me, um, was 16 and it was in his lounge and my sister saved me really because she, she doesn't recall it, but she came down and opened the door and as she opened the door, he jumped up and I think he thought he'd been caught and he never touched me again then. Sad, Andy, man. It's sad that you, but you had to go through that. So he's not just raping you, but he's also still having sex with your sister as well. Like, that's a fucking fucked up story, connection. Like, yeah. How much do you question life then? How much do you question why me? How much do you question Yeah. what is it all about? Like, I, I just, I will answer that, but, but just going back to when the age of 11, he had a, he had a girlfriend then who actually took us to Mallorca, the pair of them, and said that we, us two boys, were their, their sons. So there was some, and he'd have sex with her and then come in to the bedroom where I was because I got demoted to the single bed while she was there and then do me then as, as well, straight after having sex with her. That's how twisted that man was. See when the two kids, see when both your kids, see when the both young kids were in the room as well, was it raping both of together? Not rape, touching, yeah. And both of were there? The Jews ever both in the double bed. The Jews ever discussed that? We have since, as grown adults, but not at the time. Never said a word. Because of the fear and the power that this man had over you? Yeah. How do you then question life then, Andy? How do you then try and kick on and still be a footballer without... Because <clears throat> obviously once you got older, you'd have realised, wait a minute, I was getting abused here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But when did that sink in that what had happened? Was there a certain moment? I think the, the defining moment was 1997 because prior to that, his power was still over me and a, a number of players because he was obviously heavily involved in my family. But he wanted an affidavit 
whilst he was in Jacksonville because um, somebody came out in Jacksonville and he did a four-year sentence over there. He got convicted. Um, <clears throat> but it, the defining bit was when I give the statement and I've actually give it to the police because it, right the way up to that, he still had a, a power over me. I felt, I felt still like a child. I, and it was that defining moment really that I felt like, although I traumatized myself and I ended up with panic attacks, I felt like speaking to the police about it was the voice that I'd said it. It's fucking sick how brazen these cunts are as well, like, how fucking dark and devious they are. Like, and the scary thing is there's so many of them get away with it. Oh, yeah. Do you think that's because people are too scared to come out and give a voice? Yeah, I, I think when I broke the story, you know, there was just short of 200 people that came out for just been out. And there's many, many more. But I always said, you know, and I will, I'll still stand by this. You know, there's no written rule to st some people. The fear is too much. And the consequence from that speaking is too much fear in themselves. What the consequences to themselves, because once you do speak out, you're putting it out there rather than, you know, people say putting it in boxes and they locked it away. And I get that, but. The unfortunate thing is fit, the, the trauma sits in you and it it defines your life, really. How do you then trust in a relationship, male, female, like anybody that comes into your life then? Was everything totally broken? Did you still feel fragile looking for someone to love you? Yeah, that's the key. And many people will say that <clears throat> when you've been abused and you've been raped in all kinds of abuse, you tend to have this... Um, desire to for affection for somebody to love you and you can fall in love very easily very quickly i know that because of past and my relationships have all failed in the past because of you know putting yourself and going over over what you sh a balanced life because you you over love somebody because you just want somebody to love you did you feel as if he loved you even though i would fucking dark shit it was doing to you in a way I hate, hate to say this but in their minds in many of them in paedophiles in their in their mens rea they believe they do yeah it's sick isn't it because like, it's a mindset that can't be changed no it's a mindset that can't be changed and no. the amount of people who the, the sentences here in the UK are shocking like I've had so mm. many people on now that there's people getting community service for raping kids Community yeah. service getting let out to rape more kids, and then maybe getting six months in prison. And and the judicial system, I can go into that. Into you know, I was in the police for so many years, but the the justice. So Barry Bennell gets thirty six years, and there's another hundred and odd that never will. Who gave statements that never will get justice, and they feel. I feel for them. I'll, I'll campaign and fight for the rest of my life. That was wrong. That needs an inquiry later down the line, but. He got 36 years because every every media um, every media around the world were watching what happened to this case. So they were under quite a scrutiny, really, to put a, a big sentence on him. But what about the cases that don't get in the media? And like you say, community service, suspended sentences. When was the last time like, when you were 18 and 16 it stopped? Mm. So how did what happened with your career then? Because you, you played for a few teams. Like, could you enjoy your football or was there always something missing? <laughs> no, it was always it was always something missing. But and it, it, it tended to be before the game, the team talks, the manager shouting and encouraging, but I could always see him. And it used to flip round my head constantly. Um, but once I got over that line, you're not able to think because you, you, you're in the game and it's all split seconds. So once I got over that line, I was all right. But it was getting over that line. <clears throat> and say if there'd have been a corner or something like that or something, had, then it, I'd get a thought in my mind. So it was always a constant fight or battle. Mm -hmm. 
Well, that's fuck. Like, how were you in like changing rooms and round other team members? Like, were you constantly have your guard up, or were you? Yeah. Like, how did always how, how's always? And unfortunately, it's like for me, I was at Crew and I got a chance to leave at twenty one. I played for the first team a few times. I was on the bench, and but it was. I could I could go on for hours about what actually happened at Crew, but I never did reveal that in the last six years. But I got away, and then I went to Bury, and then I ended up two players there were at Crew, so it was like ugh. So there was Michael Jackson there, and then there was a lad called Tony Rigby, and I kind of went, oh no, I've gone back, and I I'm going back to my past, and it was it wasn't their fault. They didn't well, did they know? that's another story but i went back there i was i was going back to crew again so it was hard in the dressing room as well because i knew what had happened and then everybody in every dressing room in the country oh crew oh yeah the bum boys that oh uh, yeah grady benel everybody knew it, it was and that's the thing with football it was all ring fence it never came out but it within the industry it was all talked about and uh yeah throughout my career will always have a towel on me. Always, you know, go in the shower and it was like, and I've always had that. Um, and that's part of the abuse. Why do you think there's so much cover up within football, especially with paedophile rings? It's the biggest industry, potentially. Well, you can go to FIFA, can't you? FIFA. <laughs> you hear a lot about corruption and the money and <laughs> clubs that are owned. FA, big organisation, big institute. PFA, big institute. The word institute, very powerful, aren't they? And what went on back then, they didn't expect me to come, that's for sure. Um, and what I've experienced since, there's a lot to be said about it. And I've got a lot to say about it. And, you know, when an institute is under fire, they will do all means to to protect that. So you went, like, were you ever paid money to be quiet? Did anybody ever say, like, just sweep it under the carpet like a lot of clubs do, like a lot of people do? I wouldn't say I was offered money to keep quiet, but there was things going on within the institutes that were trying to keep me on board to keep it level, a level playing field. So it's sad to think that what actually goes on and the, the depths it goes to, because we know personally that how dark and fucking devious this world can be. Like, mm. See, when you started, who was the first person you spoke to? In what respect? In what everything that went on, did you ever speak to anybody? No, <clears throat> my family, obviously at 97, the only people that knew really was people that were very, very close to me. Never spoke within. The only, I mean, Neil Warnock and Stan Turnan had, when I'd spoke in 97, they were aware of it. Um, but other than that, it was that revelation in, in The Guardian with Danny Taylor. So when you spoke about it in 97, what happened? <sighs> what What happened? I I gave a statement. They were jumping up and down the detectives because they got the golden nugget with me, being with my sister. Um, I revealed to them, and the police, the two detectives, ran to the car and took a statement there and then. I gave 20% of what had happened. I'd just revealed the biggest thing in my entire life. Looking back on it now, or now, they'd never be able to get away with that, but they did. And they, I gave my statement, and it was like, we'll be in touch. I got a phone call the day of trial and all the phone call was, he's pleaded guilty, goodbye. And still to this day, I don't know what he was sentenced for, for me, because he did a plea bargain. I don't know to this day what happened. However, what also happened, which is quite ironic, is that a paedophile who was a football coach for a professional club, there was only an article in the, Crew Sentinel, which was about 10 lines. Who knows why? 
Yeah, so it's the same as Celtic Boys Club. Like mass paedophile ring there. I'm a Celtic supporter and like, mm. uh, but the thing with Glasgow at Celtic Rangers it's it's like point scoring. Yeah. But the bottom line is innocent kids were getting abused. Doesn't matter what fucking team it is, like there's paedophiles no. everywhere. Mm. But there seem to have been a, a lot in Celtic Boys Club. They've all been a few of them have all been fucking sentenced. That's right. And rightfully so. But yeah. It's took so many years. In my opinion, if you're covering up for paedophiles, you're just as bad as them. Absolutely implicit with it. Yeah, I believe so. Like, uh, and it's like crew, you know. Uh, the fans have always said when I broke the story and after, it's not the fans' fault, and it's not you know those that w those that weren't implicit or knew about it. It's not the staff's fault. It's those in power and those that were implicit to it that are responsible for it, and they are implicit with it. And it's like Celtic Boys Club, you know. I know a lady up there, Michelle, Michelle Gray, she's fighting hard to get justice. Um, and it took a long time. It took a lot of fighting up there in Scotland. And I did say that, you know, in England, it's hard enough. In Scotland, it's it's even tougher. Yeah, It's a tough, tough world up there. I spoke to Michelle, did her brother not take her leave? That's right. Yeah, I, spoke I spoke to, to Andrew Michelle. before, and I, I, I had two hours conversations with him, and... I was, you know, I was devastated what happened to Andrew because, you know, he was one of the first to come and he said to me, he said, but for you, Andy, I would never have, I would never have spoke in Scotland, never, ever, because up here it's like completely different world to you down there. Yeah. And unfortunately he lost his life, but the legacy is left behind in Scotland. It will always be there. Do you think that's one of the reasons why people don't speak out as well is because they're scared of the backlash from yes. people? The kids have been abused, but yet people hate on them because they think they're exposing their football team or this and that. Fuck Absolutely. the football team. This is innocent fucking kids, yeah. man. Protect your kids. Completely. At all costs. If you're moaning about somebody exposing a football Completely. team, Completely. for me, you're just as fucking bad. What are you hyping? Yeah. Like, yeah. This is kids. This is fucking yeah. kids. Like, yeah. As a father, you should be doing everything to protect your kids. Like, the thing about Scotland is it's tit for tat. It's yeah. just like fucking idiots moaning about, oh, yeah. your team done this, your team, yeah, who fucking yeah. cares? Expose the nonsense. Let's speak it. I, I spoke to Michelle. I think yeah. she was going to come on the podcast, but I don't know. It was maybe a year, two years ago. Yeah. Um, and I think it was all over the news. But yeah, and God rest the boy's soul. That yeah. Do you f find that it's, that's why people struggled because of backlash Def from definitely it's like rival the, fans and stuff. Oh yeah, absolutely. And the trolls, I, the, the trolling I had. You know, I had I had a message on Twitter about three weeks after I broke the story, and. I didn't know who it was at the time, but he end, they, I ended up finding him and I made sure the police, the police weren't going to do anything about it. And I went, no, this is ruined. This could have, I, I fainted on the floor, you know, the posing to be Barry Bunnell. You know, you want to suck on my lollipop. I fucking hit the floor. You know, they, they'd actually had a Twitter account with his picture on it, Barry Bunnell. You know, and they, they will, but I think people, the problem is, is, Fans are passionate about their football club, and I get that completely. It, they live and, you know, they have tattoos and everything else. But one thing I can say about fans, take away the football club, take away the fact it's football. It's human beings, and it is children. And to, to take away that, watch it, whichever football club it is, whether it's Man City, Man United, Celtic, or Rangers, take away the football, it's children. And it's adults that are implicit or doing it to those children. And if if it was their child and how much it would ruin their lives, but also the parents' lives is ruined and the ripple effect it has on them, really think about that because that's what it is. Take out the football out of it. It's a paedophile who's abusing a child. Oh, you're saying that's the way I see it. But again, a lot of football fans are deluded. Because mm. football's all they've got. Being a football fan is all yeah. they've got. Their team is all they've got. They'll go and see them every yeah, yeah, week. Yeah. They'll look in Sky News to see who they're signing, who's yes. injured. Yes. That is all they've got. And so mm. if they if they think they're targeting their team, then they'll stand by their team no matter yeah. if it's the wrong decision. That's how fucking yeah. warped some people I, can I be instead that. of looking at mm. exactly what you've just said. Yeah, there. yeah. Makes perfect sense to me. Yeah. And but again, that's the world we live in. See, when the story broke, like, how were you feeling? Were you nervous or did you feel a sense of relief that it was off your shoulders? <clears throat> yeah, I mean, you know, I, I, was, I was in fear, a lot of fear. And 
it took her an awful lot. And I spoke to Neil Warnock and Stan Turner, and I've said it numerous times on interviews. Um, but it it was it was a case of I don't know. There was something in my gut. I go by my gut, and I've you know the one thing I've not gone with my gut is my bloody relationships. But everything else, I've always gone with my gut, and I knew that it was the right thing to do. Do you in relationships? Do you become because of the pain and trauma you've got? Do you become hard work? Yeah, I have been. Mm -hmm. I'm not now, but I have been. Yeah, but it's understandable as well. Like how when you say you fall in love fast, you just want somebody there to numb the pieces or put the pieces together. Where, yeah. but you know yourself, the, the, they'll always be broken because that's fucking yeah. trauma. That's pain. And exactly, I was listening to someone actually on the train down here today, and they were just saying you've got to a, a car crash. He lost mm. his lost his wife, his yeah. son, his nephew, and I think his mum. And the car crash and the therapist says, How that will ever be happy again? Mm. And he says, You what do I do to be happy or something? He says, and he says, You've got to find purpose. Yeah. Got to find a bit of purpose and Absolutely. And that's the sad thing because the pain's always there. They always mm. say time's a healer, but it's not really. You kinda no. time makes you adapt to the pain. It yeah. makes you accept the pain. Because yeah. the pain's there, it just doesn't seem Absolutely. as bad. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, like, exactly. You find that, like you had to find a something to get yeah. up and fight for. Yeah. And, you know, with me, I, I said when I first broke the story, you know, I, I'd had 20 odd years of therapy. You know, I'd, I'd picked, I'd, I'd made my toolbox because not all therapists are great. Some are better than others, like, like life, you know. But I'd picked out, I'd got my toolbox together and, you know, the poor people that, don't have that or haven't had that it's it's hard it's hard to to move forward um but i had that i had that fight in me um in 2016 and i really was ready to go um but the last six years um i've been destroyed why um by institutes Because when you break, when you're a whistleblower, and you are a whistleblower in in the biggest sport in the world, it can have its consequences. Do you have fear for your own life? Yeah. Mm. How deep does it go then, Andy? It goes very deep because oh. it's like you know going into the last six <clears throat> years, me breaking the story, and you know I'm I'm all about truths. And, you know, I proved that in 2016 when I told the truth. And I was on Victoria Derby's show and I'm, I'm, you know, I'm honest about it all. And that became, I was trending above Trump because people saw my truths and saw, and the other players saw, it's Woody, it's Andy. I've got to come forward because... I've always been the softest soul off the pitch. On the pitch, I was a bit, a bit different, but <clears throat> I'm about truths and honesty. And I also am about rights and wrongs. And it was wrong what happened all those years. But when you're taking on big institutes and it becomes a huge story and you're not implicit to their rules that they want to achieve and you say no you become a sitting target people potentially take your life because you're trying to expose people who've done wrong yeah hmm. did you ever contemplate suicide in the last six years yeah because i was pushed that far what? and I, when i broke the story uh, there's numerous interviews that i did and i said I was 11 and it's took me till I'm 43 to be strong enough. And I was strong. Did all those interviews, did it all around the world. I went to Brazil and saved kids' lives out there. And I was strong. I can say now in 2023, the trauma I've been through in the last six and a half years is on par to the abuse I've suffered as a child. Do you think that's it coming to a head where it's been so long in the making where you've spoke about it, you've released it, mm. but you've still not 
wouldn't say healed from it because I don't know if you'll ever be healed if I'm honest but, no. but it just comes to the surface there's a, a kind yeah. of explosion with it when you think fucking hell that it's a realisation what you've actually been through yeah there's elements of that you know when when I broke it and it, it went huge it was emotionally and it was tiring and you know I was pleading with the police to help me and they didn't it took them three or four weeks of hundreds of emails hundreds and hundreds coming at me which was which was draining but I was I was prepared I was prepared when it went big I was prepared of you know I'm on the I'm here for a reason I'm a warrior I'm I'm strong enough I'm I've got all this these tools in the box to keep going and keep going and keep going um but after that sort of initial crescendo it went up like that was a point where I stood up and I went no you're you're all wrong behind the scenes and I never said another word and I've kept quiet since then and I've never you know I've not done articles and not spoke to anyone I've kept myself to myself because I was ostracized and I was put out you know I broke the biggest story that's hit the world in football and I was pleading with them let me be involved because I'll be truth. I am truth. And they knew I was truth. And when you're, when you are empowered and you become quite powerful, I did become quite powerful because I was doing every, I was doing from CNN to you name it. They didn't want me to be in there. So because with the story as well, and it's it's such a fucked up story from the man who was abusing you, mm. then marries your sister, but his mm. uncle mm. murdered your mum's yeah. sister. Yeah, where's yeah. all that connection come from? That like, well, the Jews know this. They know, but did he not have a photo of the guy who killed your yes, auntie? He and he used to was it Freddie or something? You know, it's um, Ronald. Ronald Ronnie. He used yeah. to call him because I read, yeah, Ronnie, and yep. he had a photo of him, and he raped and killed your auntie. Yes, right, yeah. And that's yeah. some fucked up shit, man. That's like yeah. Hollywood serial killer, weird fucking yeah. satanic madness. Like it is. What is that connection with all that then? No connection. There's is it one of those things. Weird is it one things? of those things? There's a path in life we have, and you know my. My parents didn't know, I had no idea, until a police officer came to them after I'd given the statement to say that it was his cousin. And I had a flashback to him taking me to a block of flats and seeing a picture. And it's amazing how you remember pictures. And I went, he was in that picture. And yeah, it was 1971 and he, raped and murdered my mum's sister and it was his cousin yet so many years later in 1983 this was his 71 in 83 Benel wouldn't have known initially but he found out because he was involved in the family and then he found out that it was actually his cousin that murdered my mum's sister but then continued to rape me then continued with my sister who is named after my, my auntie, knowing full well that his cousin had murdered my mum's sister and continued with the family to continue to rape both of us and then go on to marry my sister. Did he ever have any kids? Yeah, he had two with my sister, yeah. Have you got a relationship with them? Yeah, yeah. They've been protected. How do you how do you become so guarded then? Because like I spoke earlier with Sarah Sands, she get, let the old man take him and work with the man where the old bastard abused her sons. Like how your parents been so protective for you? Like how do you find balance? Because I know how like I've spoken about this in podcasts before. I don't let my daughter have sleepovers. No, and she hates me for it. And yeah, I, yeah. I don't want to be that dad. I no. always thought I'd be a fun, friendly, just having a laugh, dad. I'm so fucking protected because I've spoke to so many people and I know how dark and fucked up this world is. I had undercover paedophile on who went undercover for 20 years to catch the most fucking darkest people on this yeah. planet. And the shit that he was saying, because a lot of these predators, they don't start on the kids, start on the parents. That's right. Fucking single parents have gone apps right. on Facebook. Vulnerability. Yeah, work on the parents. Yeah. And then they'll not make their move to the, on the kid yeah. for two or three years. It's yeah. not an instant thing. You said you get some predators who like to smell hair and yeah. walk around just to feel 
just Absolutely. want to feel around kids. Yeah. You've got some people who work yep. on the job for two, three years to get what they want at the end. And then once they've got their fix, they end up killing the kid or they end yep. up taking their own life. But that's it's, right. It's that's and that's the mindset of people nowadays. It's fucked up. It's so yes. fucked up that like, how do you then find the balance with your sister's kids that like, knowing what's went on? It's difficult. It, it, it is a net they they know that. Um, How old so are they, sorry? They're, well, one's 30 now and one's 20, 28. So they'll know everything 27. then? It's out there in the open? Yeah, yeah, How absolutely. How are they, 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 My nephew's really struggled when I broke the story and it's it was hard for him because he didn't know he was only eight, but, you know, you can imagine knowing that your blood father is what he is um and he he's got a look of him as well which is difficult for me it was not now but going through um the process that i've been through it was difficult and it's been difficult for him but you know what he's done is he's 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 had some therapy and he's had some help um and he's doing great now but he's had his own issues because of that see the thing is andy it's as if you can never get away from him no, no, it's not, it's not no, even a bad it's thing. True. It's true, but he's there. Yep. Every story, every interview, he's yeah, there. Absolutely. Do you feel as if he'll be loving that? Do you feel as if he'll still have that power, or do you feel as if it's, it doesn't have the same impact? Doesn't it say have the same impact on me now yeah. at all? Not even remotely. But for him, yeah. He he he. He feels probably now, still now, you know, I still love Andy. That's the, that's how their brains are. That's not Sandy that a man who was raping you as a kid, mm. basically raping your sister, marries your sister, has two kids with your sister, his cousin killed your mum's sister. Mm. Do you ever feel cursed in a yeah. way? I do now. And we'll go into it, but I, I had a spiritual awakening in December 2020 and, you know, by the grace of the universe, I was brought together with um, Kelly, which I'll talk about. But until then, I spent my life like, you know, I wasn't religious and I'm, I'm not religious for say, um, but I've spent my life asking and going, why? Why me? What? What have I done to, to to deserve this? What has my family done to deserve this? Why am I, you know, am I cursed? Is 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 my purpose in this life to just be abused, raped? And also I asked the question about my relationships because unfortunately, you know, I've got a lot to say. I wrote my book and I put certain things in there about my previous relationships. But the people... I, I did wrong in certain parts of the relationship, but the women I was with, not all of them, but some of them were really abusive physically as well. You know, I've got scars all over my face from being hit. And I was like, well, what, am I just like a, a protege of, you know, satanic, horrible, evil people that are just doing this to me? Why, why am I here? So I did ask that question for many years. Yeah, like how, like, do you think you accept pain and abuse a lot longer than you should? Yeah. Because you're, you think they'll heal you or help you or save you? or Do you, do you feel it as if you needed saved? I think, no, I think from, from and other people will, um, will be able to understand this that have gone through. So from a man to a woman, to a gay relationship, whatever relationship, with that coerce and control and narcissistic people that, because they the pedophiles are narcissistic, they just go to an absolute other level. But you, once you're implicit with that and you've been in that abuse, you tend to, some people will say, well, you, you, you can walk away or why don't you walk away from that? And because, you put up with it. You've put up with that abuse, the physical, the sexual, you put up with the mental abuse and it just becomes like, well, I have to put up with this. And you end up looking back on it after you step out and you get the courage to walk away because the threats are there to say to you, 
If you walk away, you're nobody. I will destroy you. I've had it from women. I will destroy you. And they've tried. Even up to recent years, I will destroy you. Well, destroy me then. And they've tried to. But once you walk away from it and then look back, you see the relationship as it was and how bad it was. But once you're in it, it's hard to get out. Yeah, it's mad, like... Because it, you look at the Michael Jackson thing, now, I, I love Michael Jackson when I was mm. a kid and I used to always think, yeah. you hear stories, it was chemically castrated with his dad because he wanted to keep his yeah. his voice like a kid. But then, as more and more time goes on, you start to realise, well, wait a minute, like, you wanted kids to stay with you and then when you speak to survivors, you look at the yeah. same tactics of using their, their sort of power of, yeah. I can get you a football team, mm. I can get you a music, I can yeah. get you into music, I can get you a music yeah. video. Like, if you want a kid to stay with you, you're a fucking sex case. Like, I love my kids. I love them mm. daily. I would die for them, yeah. no problem. I would kill for them, no problem. Yeah. But they're fucking pains in the asses. Of course they are. Anyway, I'll cut a few hours and I'm thinking, like, you're fucking doing my head. <laughs> yeah. in. Like, when it broke to your mum and dad, like, the fucking guilt they must have had. Huge. Like, how did they get through that? And, and did, how did they question, how did they, like, question it? It was difficult. I think from speaking to my mum now, um, on what she said, they kept it to themselves and there was a lot of tears in the bedroom and the guilt that they had was guilt ridden but the the problem is is with the grooming of parents it's like it's like the abuse that they suffered they kept to themselves as well so they're traumatized by it and they don't like talking about it and it be it became a hidden secret within the family and it's still still pretty much like that now that nobody wants to talk out about it they don't want to talk about it we want to put it in a box and we all have different ways of dealing with things you see you know me i'm on a i'm a speaker now i'll speak out but i understand that they want to keep it in so that guilt ridden and i've spoke to many parents that after i broke the story that have said i feel relieved that i don't have that guilt anymore because that guilt can can it can define their lives as relationships as I don't know how mum and dad stay together. And there was a lot of growing up after the abuse, there was a lot of arguments between them. Um, but with what I did, it released their guilt. Did you ever blame them at any point? How they didn't protect you? Yeah, I've questioned it. Never spoke to them about it, but yeah. Why, why couldn't you see it? Why could, why didn't you why didn't you protect me like you did when you when I was younger? I had all those questions in my head, um, but now after releasing everything and going over years and years and years, that man was he 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 groomed parents as much as he did the kids. How do we protect kids then, Andy? With people working in schools and football teams, and I've friends with Terry. Uh, Terry Ellis, um, and he's a leading polygraph expert in the UK. Like, I know they say they can't use them in court, this and that, but if it gives you a rough incline of how people's methods are, like, are you sexually attracted to the kids? Simple question, you get the answers back in 15 minutes. Anybody that's going to work with kids, I believe mm. there should be a polygraph test there just to say, like, mm. let's see, because yeah. it's it just seems I don't know if it's because of social media and a lot of people are speaking out, but it seems to be getting fucking worse. Like how do we protect kids more? What, what do you think should be in place? Well, it's it's funny you should say that. It's like you know, I've got so much that I, you know, so much that I've got in the last six and a half years, and you couldn't do this in an hour. You know what I, I could say about everything, but there's one thing that I did. You know, even with when you with, the problem is with the institutes, they they want to do it their way or the highway, and they're always right and multi-billion pounds organizations and institutes they 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 put it out there after i'd done everything and oh we're, we've got this safeguard new safeguarding for the effect new safeguarding for this but i gave a holistic solution and i had a lot of key people around this country and i met with the fa the pfa and the premier league and it wasn't just about kids it was about professional players and those that retire after the retire and the mental health and you know it was everything it was a holistic solution and me being the soft one that i was that i've learned from handed it over to them and then a year later 
the mental health awareness came out with William and Harry, mental health in football. And I felt a kick in the teeth, but what it did reiterate to me is that, you know, they will, they will touch on it because it's a hot subject. But is that implemented in grassroots football now? I spoke to several people that go, still the same, Andy. It's like the government, oh, we'll do this. It's a minefield and it's so hard, but more needs to be done. The football, though, it's kind of, it's a man's game. People, yeah. like, how well does there nobody come out as gay? And mm. British football, I think a young kid last year maybe came out, but it's fucking 2023. Who mm. fucking cares? But do you think that because there's so much pressure on the stigma of being a footballer and the, the, the abuse people would get by coming out as gay? Like, if they, yeah. Like, watch, if you can't come out as gay... Mm. then what chances people coming out and trying exposing people who's abused them as a kid mm. but it's, diff it's such a hard it's such a hard sport like with yeah. you with the Chinese whispers behind you and yeah. you're trying to expose that and people yeah, talking yeah, shit yeah. behind your back that makes people Absolutely. then go back in their share and not yeah, want to speak yeah, about yeah. it like, why do you think football's got that though like not many people come out or... It, it's people... funny you should say that because it's like... So wh when you think about it, like, you know, when I when I did what I did and it became it became global news. I mean, I did... I've done every magazine in Europe. I did Australia BBC. I've done Colombia, Br Brazil, everywhere, America. It went as far as Dubai. I did Andy Gray and um, Richard Keyes. And it was such the hot topic child abuse in football that he couldn't the lid had gone off so those in power couldn't put the lid on it so what their strategy was it was independent review which is not independent by the way and i will speak about that sometime in the future that they had to wait for it to simmer and then put a lid on it so what they use then is the mental health in men and football right okay this is the big taboo. So all the players and all ex-players and all the pundits, oh, let's talk about mental health in, in football. And then this child abuse became non-existent. Do you see any reports about child abuse in the news now, in football or it's gone? That's because it's a taboo subject in football like you said about the men's sport that it is, it will infiltrate off, but it's still happening. So, you know, and the mental health situation is huge. It's massive in men and that is big. But when you talk about child abuse, it becomes a very nervous subject. What made you join the corpus? Well, it was after what had, had happened to me, you know, in football and I'd lost my career, it was, I needed a new career. And w my initial thought process was, I wanted to help people because what I'd gone through, it was, I want, I, I, I want to help. I want to help others. It wasn't like that when I went in. Why? I saw a different world in the police, very different. In what sense? I saw a lot of egos. I saw a lot of things that, well, there's a lot being, well, we know the Met at the moment, that's, there's a lot being ousted for wrongdoing, and there was a lot of that. And I even, you know, I did my first two years and I applied for the fire service because I wanted to get out because it wasn't what I thought. And I'd gone to see Barry Bennell in prison and I got back to the police station and I was off duty. And I didn't know, I, I didn't think I'd done anything wrong. I was fairly new in the police and I got frog marched in an office and they put tapes on and they interviewed me and cautioned me and said, why are you going to see a paedophile in prison? Which I absolutely shat myself and I thought, well, I've been abused as a child, so I give a taped interview. And in that taped interview, which will be there somewhere in the archives, they said, because of what's happened to you, we'll protect you from those types of cases and everything else. But I felt afterwards, I felt like I'd been, 
don't know, it's like they knew about it and it was like I felt violated by them for doing what they'd done to me. So I, I applied for the fire service, but unfortunately my ex-wife was saying that it was a drop in pay and there's no way you, you're going to leave there, but I didn't want to be in there. Uh, I just didn't, I felt, didn't like it. How hard was it for you when your football career came to an end? Devastating, because I knew what had happened to me, because I had panic disorder. I tried so hard, and I went to Sheffield United, and Neil Warnock knew I wasn't right, went just within a few months. Um, and then he offloaded to Halifax, and it's like you say about that curse. It's like I went there, and Paul Bracewell laughed after seven games. They had a three-year contract, and... They went into administration. It's only year that they got away with it and Halifax went out of the league and they ripped my contract up. I had two years left on it. And I just felt like, like you say about that, I just felt I was cursed. It was like, I've got to get out. Because football would have been your escape. Would have mm. kept you fitness. Yeah. Like, fitness is key to yeah, battling any sort of demons. And if you're training every day and yeah, you're playing yeah. at the weekend, you're kind of, you're occupied, no doubt. Listen, you've... If, you're playing football, you still think about the cunt on the park from time to time, yeah. but sometimes you're so occupied. You exactly, I was oh, saying before to yeah. you, that split second and you... Yeah, because yeah. I'll have a good day and I'm feeling good, but then a negative come in yep. and say, you shouldn't be happy today. You know, fucking yeah. ruin my full oh, day yeah. because I'll fester on it. They say yeah. I thought it only lasts about seven seconds, but as human beings, we learn how to stick on the negatives mm. and it can control you for days, months. Some people oh, years and can. years. They can never break the old yeah, cycles. Yeah, you know, I, I've done that much research. I, you know, it's funny. I had some of the latest therapy that I had. You know, he, he sat there, because I've had therapy since and everything, I broke the story and he sat there and he laughed with me because he said, do you know something, Andy? He said, you, you, you can be my therapist because you know that much on it. You know, the, the, the thought process with... With thoughts, you know, you can, a person like myself or anyone that suffered any kind of trauma, you, they say like, you, you could think 200,000 thoughts in a day and without you knowing it, one thought within seconds, you could have 50 and that can define your day, mm -hmm. like you said, and it can literally throw you in a negative spin that can ruin your day. That's why they say, take one day at a time, tomorrow's a new day, mm -hmm. because it can ruin your day. Yeah, your partner as well, who you're married to, then poisoned, dies as well. That like, yeah. But like, again, Andy, like no disrespect, but your fucking whole life is is dark clouds, mate. Like, it's yeah. it's sad, like all the yeah. shit that you went through. That like, yeah, yeah. How did that relationship start? Yeah, with Kelly. You know, I've got a big revelation with that in due time. But in terms of Kelly, I I met her in 2017, and I was getting married to Zelda at the time, and she was in a relationship with somebody and she was doing she was campaigning for to help children same ethos as me we we're on parallel paths really in terms of all our passion was in 2017 what she'd said to me is that she'd she something had happened to her as a child a very young young age but she couldn't recollect it and i'd said to her and i knew this that from the age of four to eight abuse or from younger than that abuse tends to be that you can't have you normally have like a a reel of a video of the acts and what happens to you she couldn't recall but she knew something because it defined her life and she'd had a very similar life to me and we'd had parallel lives in terms of what had happened to us as children with me i knew what had, and something had happened to her so we had like a a connection on so many levels and she she was doing something called positivity power movement and it was a positivity princess and and it was all about children helping children so we connected and we 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 started doing things together and unfortunately there was somebody that I knew that tried to drag us apart and it wasn't that time that time wasn't right for us to build on it and then in the December 2020 it was the 3rd of December and I'd had a really, really awful relationship, which was short, which was my Range Rover got taken, stolen, and the property I was in, everything got taken from it, all my possessions and everything. 
and I ended up coming back up to Manchester and she'd said that she, she, she was spiritual before, but she'd said that she'd had this spiritual awakening. She said, something got me to ring you because I knew something wasn't right with you. And I hadn't, I'd only spoke to her about six months previous and she came and picked me up and it was like she'd picked me up and it was meant to be. And she was, she had this spiritual awakening and she was spiritually connected. And I wasn't, you know, I'd had things before, but it was meant to be that we came together. And um, she told me that she was fighting for justice that had happened to her as a child. And it was linked to people around her area and institutes. And her father had committed suicide and she said, she believed it wasn't and she showed me files that she'd been researching for years and she said she was in fear for her life because of what she was about to do and I supported her and helped her but she was also spiritual and she said I've got this spiritual gift and I've got this guiding and these things are happening and everything's happening right now and um, unfortunately there's a lot to say about what happened afterwards but they said that she committed suicide in her apartment and the whole world caved in. Caved in. Because she'd even, I've got documents, I, everything's documented, but she, you know, she she actually said to me, if, if somebody takes my life, will, please, Andy, will you get justice for me? That's fucking mental, Andy. Like, <clears throat> did you feel as if that was kind of your life improving as well and now I, I i felt in those that short period i'd known her since 2017 and we were just friends you know there was nothing nothing at all in in that capacity i was getting married and she was happily with a relationship and you know i was happy at the time but yeah it was the happiest and i felt like it was meant to be and we we're on the right path to get injustice, both of us. Because it was says that she'd bought poison and killed herself. Yeah. Do you believe there's a lot more to it? Yeah. But she'll do. you'll talk about in future. In future, yeah. I, I do. And you know, this I'm about truths and evidence and evidence is evidence and honesty is honesty. And I've got the honesty box because I have got it locked away in a box. Did you get sectioned after that? I did. What was that like? Yeah, uh, and it's ironic, you know, three weeks after she'd gone and nobody knows who called or didn't call because there's nobody that's close to me, family, friends, you name it, nobody. Just three doctors and seven police officers came in, stormed into my friends who witnessed it all and witnessed things beforehand and said, we're sectioning you. It was like the matrix. And I was like, okay, I've, you know, I'm spiritually aware and you know, there's things going on in there. And so is millions of other people around the world, just cause I've got a spiritual gift or awakening. Does that make me crazy? No. So when I went in there, I told the I told the doctor the following morning. I said, "Why am I here? Three minutes. You got psychosis? No, I haven't. I'm sane. There's nothing wrong with me. I'll, I'm prescribing you with a psycho psychotic drug. If you don't take it, I'm going to inject you." I went, "What?" So he threw me out. And. How They'd long? lock me up. How long were you in there for? I was in there for two weeks. On the Monday, I put me appeal in, and solicitor said, what is going on here? Can't take everything because there's some things going on in the background to get justice. Did you ever fear for your life in there? Yeah. Because if you're trying to expose big things, man, one injection in the ass, bang, dead. You had a bad turn or a but I was reaction. sane and switched on. Were you taking tablets or were they injecting you with anything? 
They wanted liquid. But I took the tablets. Put them under your tongue? Oh, I did. Didn't take one. But they thought I had. What was it like being in the other round? People just losing I've, on that. I've got a revelation to bear in mind. Do you know, do you know, and I've got a witness as well that came in who's itching. He's been waiting for two years to back me up about not only was I sane in there, but he saw what I saw. Happy to have him on. Both used together. I've got a lot to say. What, And it, it's ironic as well. And I believe in... I believe in destiny and I believe in the universe and the universe is more powerful than any human being. And it's just, it, it dawned on me. I've got, I've got another, somebody else that was in a press witch mental hospital back in the day and they've ruined his life, ruined him. But it's funny how just a few months back that all the mental hospitals have been made accountable for how they treated people. There was a BBC documentary about it, about how the staff treated the patients, I was in there saying, and I watched it, and I've got a few little recordings, but I've also got numbers of people in there, and I said, don't worry when I get out. One day, I will speak truth, what goes on. But you know yourself, and if they send you off as a loony, send you in a loony bin, anything you say is discredited. You've got it, and that was the whole purpose. Well, I've had Barbara O'Hare on. She released a book called The Hospital. What happens is the evil doctors, predators, Jimmy Savile's driving up all the usual fucking suspects. What it used to do is get kids from broken homes, parents, addicts, homeless yep. kids, put them in a mental institute, sign them off as crazy. Some of these kids were getting drugged, raped, and killed. They were talking about using um, mind control. What's it called? Past, I can't remember, but mind control. Yeah. And what happens is with some of the kids would run away. They would run to the coppers. The coppers would phone up. Because they were signed off as crazy, the coppers would take them straight back. Yeah. They, and everybody yeah. thought Barbara Hare was a fantasist. Mm. It fucking came out 20 odd years later, she was telling the truth. Truth. Fucking evil doctors, pedophile yes. doctors, guys cutting suits coming up, yes. picking the kids up, taking them away, bringing them back. Yeah. And the kids were signed off as crazy. Yeah. As soon as you're signed off as a nutcase, then wait a yeah. minute, he's, just lo he's having an episode here, he's losing his shit. Yeah. You kind of, but I think pe more people are awakened to, wait a minute, listen, if anybody gets cancelled as well, it's because they're fucking telling the truth somewhere along the lines. Uh, yeah, truth truth and honesty, really. MK Ultra. Right. MK Ultra. So they were experimenting on kids for, she was saying to be hitmen or, mm. or mass shooters or they yeah. the experiment on the kids to walk into the water. Your instincts are just try and get out and swim. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just walk straight in and drown. And they, yeah. they dug a couple of the bodies up many yeah. years later that she was telling the fucking mm. truth. I, I I did I did actually well when I was in there there was a there was another young lad um, um, from Africa and he was he, he had a similar exactly similar experience to me he was saying he but but he his dad was a top doctor in Africa and there was something going on with him and the UK and he was going to speak and because of that they just turned up at his flat and the police and threw him in and you know there is and, and there's one thing I would I will say is that there was there was poorly people in there that were but what I did see is that there were certain individuals in there that weren't as bad as what the medication that they were taking they literally were zombied and more, and there was so much more that went on in there that made me cry at night, what I used to listen to. And I'm talking serious. Talking abuse again? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I physically watched it. And more. And it's as if you've never got away from it. I know. That's when the... You make, do you ever go, what the fuck? Like, yeah. Like, I've interviewed some mad yeah, people, yeah. mad stories, and I think yeah. heartbreaking, but the level and the extent yeah, yeah. and the madness, how everything is yeah. connected. Like, yes. The, your wife, father was suicide, she's suicide, your yeah. auntie raped, murdered, yeah. Yeah. you raped, your sister raped. I know. Like, it's mad because all my, uncle, all my dad's uncles were murdered back in Glasgow, yeah. four or five. 
all my uncles are murdered. Yeah. But is there a connection of coming back? Or, or like, yeah. Do you ever but think all, that, man? But it, when, when, you, when, you really, when you really do sit down like I have, and, you know, I was a detective, I'm clever. I'm, you know, there's nothing wrong with my brain, and I am clever. I am on it, and I have been on it. I've been making timelines and doing everything in, in my apartment, putting it all together. And there's no coincidence in this connection everywhere, but me being in the middle of that connection that everything links up. And it's like, it's like a ring of steel, and I've been in this, like, vortex of, like, it's like it's been everything's linked to me but there is a link to them if that makes sense it's all connected it's all connected and i said in 2016 i said there's a ring there's a pedophile ring in football and lo and behold they all come out chelsea we used to go to the norwich cup the ipswich cup the southampton cup the celtic cup they didn't have internet then but they had ways of communication and that's how they did it it's like now it's the ring of steel and it's like there's no coin and the other thing as well it's like going back to what you said when i was talking about being in that hospital at that time i was in there and i got out and because i wanted to finish about that because i also spoke to all the institutes in there pleading with them to do something for me to get me out no beds, Andy, we're sorry. On the Friday, the Monday, it was the the appeal. Bosh, out you go. So they found me somewhere in London. Voluntary. And then because of that as well, I was actually told that I was going to give a statement about what happened to Kelly. I never give that statement. Never been asked. But they wait two years and I got I get summons to the coroner's court. Two police officers turn up at my mum's. I've got a summons for Andrew Woodward to give evidence at the coroner's court for Kelly Walsh's death. Didn't even know. And then I got thrown in the corner for over two hours, being grilled. And then the Daily Mail do a piece about it. And I've got a lot to say about that because you don't do that to people. What did they say? Well, the, the report was, I was questioned and it was said, you know, it was a odd relationship and there was things and quotes in there from certain individuals that are not truths. And I have the truth, but I was never asked to tell the truth. That's newspapers for you, Andy. You should not have. Well, not only in, no, not in not in the newspapers, in the coroner's court. I was never asked to tell the truth until I was in that box. But do you mean a weird relationship? Said it was because she had a spiritual gift, and the spiritual gifted people around the world. There's people that get paid a lot of money with spiritual gifts. Said she was crazy. She wasn't. How hard is that for you to, to for them to sign her off as crazy? Hurts. And saying I was crazy. The most sane person. And also, when you say about discrediting, discrediting somebody, if if I can pass every psychiatrist um, assessment after that, within three, four months after that, because I was doing a film with the BBC, Floodlights. I passed every psychiatric, everything. And ongoing through that, and went on live TV. No medication, never took any. I know the BBC gets a lot of stick, but and rightly so with some of the shit they've been involved mm. in. But fair play to them for doing that documentary and for them, fair yeah. play for doing that for them, like exposing it stuff. Is, it is fair play. Yeah, it is fair play. Credit where credit's due, definitely. But there is a big but. There's more to reveal on them, 
I've been inside it for four years. And I've got a truth about that and all documented how I was treated. And the BBC, you just got to look at the statue that's outside that. The fucking nuns who, who made the statue, the sex yeah. case. Yeah. Like, and the statue is still there. Yeah. Well, but I just thought for, if they'd done the film, then fair play that. Not yeah, everybody in the BBC. Absolutely. Listen, it's like the coppers are good and bad. Same and in the BBC, there'll be good people and, and shit people. It. You've got it, James, because that's the initial feeling I felt to start with. And I was advised to. I could have gone Netflix. I didn't want money. I've never been about money, this. This is all about principle. It's about justice. It's about rights. It's about getting it out there. Honesty. I felt the same. I thought, fair play, BBC, Jimmy Savile, everything else that had gone on, all fair play. The film is the film. Doesn't tell what I wanted to tell, which is fair enough. They only could air it for a certain amount. And I went with the script, but there's a lot goes on inside there. And I, I know. I know. How dark is all these big productions? How fucked up are they? How dark is the pedophile rings in football teams? Like how how connected is it? Like why is all those teams that have been exposed all connected? But like Jerry McCann, Madeline McCann's father, doctor at Celtic Park. It's all linked. It, it's it's bigger. It's bigger than this, you know. And it it, it is bigger than this. It, it's you know you can go into the like you were talking before about satanic, I'm not religious, but there is a dark and light. And the dark has been pff, overpowering the light through generations. It goes bigger. It's a ring of steel. It's all linked. You you can look at, I mean, I'm not Freemasons. Freemasons, there's so many out there that are like all institutes. It's like the police. The police got rid of me. I've got a truth with that. What they did to me to get rid of me. That's the truth. I broke the story. Oh, let's discredit him. Oh, Andy Woodward, why did you leave the police? Well, I've got the truth, but I'm not, I'm not gonna speak out to defend myself, but I, I've got the truths. Why did they do this? You know, they're all, they're all linked. There's a big link and it's very powerful. And who am I, Andy Woodward, to take that on? See, because you were abused in that when you are younger, you, did you ever question how you would have turned out as well? Because they talk about, I had the undercover paedophile on as well, and he, because he was so involved, and he says to his therapist, because he was seeing it so much, he was actually scared that it became one. Yes. And, he yes. Said, and I respected that because I mm. thought, fucking fair play, because yeah, he's yeah. seen the videos and the footage, he's pretending to be yeah. one, he thought it would he would become one himself. Yeah. Like, see, because yeah. of all the shit that you've been through and there is a connection yeah. of people getting abused to then go on to go abuse on to themselves. Go on to be abusers, yes, yeah, Was yeah, that yeah. a concern in your mind? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, 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 well, what it is, is, you know, with me, it was more, it was more for me that, number one, the first thing that I really struggled with was a sexuality thing. What am I? Am I that? Am I this? You know, at 18, a person I was with, I had a, I had a child on the way. And I look up there and I, that was to show like, didn't, I was too young for that, but it's like, no, I'm going to be a dad and I'm, I'm that way. Then the abuse come abuser is that you go through that process, thought process is that it's a fear of it, that, that those, and I went completely the other way, where I was like in fear of going near any children and my own child, like, and when you're with narcissists and I've been with them, one of them actually said to me, I don't trust you with my child, but that was a narcissistic way of destroying me, putting me further down. And that was abuse in itself. But yeah, it, it, it I can understand people having that view, but with me, with my mindset, I flipped it on its head. And I was like, douche, no. Some people, they say that some people do turn out to be abusers. 
What percentage? I don't know. Maybe in their minds that they go, well, I have to do what? But there's some that go, well, I was abused as a child, so that's why I am the way I am. No. That's an excuse with those. See, when you spoke out and, and exposed it all, did any other footballers come forward and maybe not say anything but says, look, I was I went through the same? Ones that haven't spoke to... Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there's, there's lots. There's lots. And there's also those, you know, it's like Matt Letizia, uh I will speak to him at some point, but Matt, Matt stood up, you know, at the start. He was the only pundit that actually put his face on the paper and said about Bob Higgins and said, yeah, something not right and did massages and not, I don't know what, how far it went with him, but he stood up. But it's like pundits as well. It's like people in the media. It's like, you know, I know of several. I know somebody that's very high up within the England team. Did any of them step up? Great, you've got a voice. No. It's to protect, I understand to protect their, what they're doing, but sometimes it takes, you know, to take something on, you have to have, you have to have balls and you have to be a warrior. Yeah, that's why I like Matt Tizzi. That's why I've got nothing but love for him because he speaks Likewise, how he sees life. He says you truth. You might not agree with him all the time, no. but he still get the balls to and fucking yeah. stand at the forefront. Lost his job. Yeah. Lost the fucking everything. Yeah. But he's still doing his thing. So that's what it's all about. There's too many people caught up in their own little world yeah. and forget what life's all about. Like, it's like me. It's trying to exactly. do the right thing. It is, and it, and it is. It's like me, you know, work. I've been fucking thrown that many places in life. But it's, it's having that, you know, truth is truth. But we have free will. Everybody in life has free will. We can choose what we want. I prefer to choose balance, honesty, and I can sleep at night. People in fear or people that are narcissistic and not, those are the ones that will sleep at night that don't care. But then there's people that wish they could have that to speak out how was it when you spoke out and people turned their back how's that feeling can you understand it as well that they'll lose their job or they'll be scrutinised yeah, as well and that's it, what I'm it, saying it's, yeah, it's I, fucking I, cowardly I, but I, can you see the other side of it I, as I said then you've got your your ones that have got pure ego and greed and narcissist or will step over anyone to get money power greed you name it you've got that set and then you've got a set that are in fear because they would like to speak out or they would like to talk or they would like to join an army but they're just in fear it's like it's the livelihoods it's family it's whatever reason and that i understand because not all of us are prepared to step up on the parapet and just go do you know what it is what it is how many coaches have been exposed over the last few years? Now? A lot. I, I I don't know the stats now, but I know in in the film, I think there was 284 football clubs. <sighs> but they say one in every 30 has got pedophile tendencies. Yeah. So that's one in every street. Yeah, every street. And what's sad as well is the public don't know, and I was in the police, and the way the judicial system works with when they're out of prison, you know, I spoke to somebody the other day, and I speak to them all the time, and, you know, they're in fear because that person that actually raped a, a girl that's now a woman is being put back a mile away from where she lives now. And that ain't right. <sighs> but it's all the same as the nonces that get put out houses Absolutely. next to schools. They do. And I've been saying this the last few podcasts, but in Russia, they bang, do. life sentence. Our death penalty. Australia, take their passports, take their driver license. You can't fucking leave. Here you can change your name for less than 20 quid. Yes. To abuse again. Exactly what he did. He, he changed his name from Barry Bennell. Changed it. You know, and what he did, what he did think of he changed his name to Richard Jones. He was thinking, Jones, popular name. Smith, popular name, isn't it? Jones. Mm -hmm. 
But where do you go from here then, Andy? I know you've you've got so much more to talk about and want to expose, but right yeah. now you can't because obviously yeah. so many legal reasons and yeah, obviously yeah, to protect yeah. yourself. But yeah. where do you go forward for the future? I think, you know, I do believe because of, you know, that spiritual awakening that I had, you know, I can't, I'm not going to ignore it because... I look back at my life and I, I do believe that my path of life is set out for me in terms of helping others, getting justice and find, well, revealing truths. And I've got an army of people and I, you know, it's funny, I've been able to realize now the ones that, one of your friends, two of your enemies and three of those in between. And I know each and every one of them. And going forward, I will, I will, it's took a lot, you know, I've had suicide thoughts over the last six years and they've floored me, they've destroyed me, they've done everything they possibly can to me. Um, but now I'm on on, an, on a balanced, balanced way now. I'm back to balance. And my future, we don't know what the future is. We can never, we can never say, I'm going to be this. But what I can say, the difficult thing I've had, James, is that all those where they wanted, they wanted a piece of me meat, every single one of them. I met a journalist a few months back, a big one as well, and I told him, blah, oh, Andy, this is a film in itself. And there is filmmakers that do want to do a film, another one, for the last six years, big. But he said, oh, Andy, this is... Whew. Next day, we can't, Andy. It's too much. It shows that the stuff that I have got is is big and I have to be very careful. What sort of stuff are you talking? Paedophiles? Yeah. Paedophiles and, and more. And corruption. But you expose that, you know, your good chance you'll be getting poisoned or you'll be going missing. But you've kind of went through everything else anyway. Yeah, that kind of in thing. the last six years. Fuck I've... it. Yeah, for the last fucking 30 odd years, Andy, like, you've kind of... It's, it's, like, yeah. it's, I wouldn't say you're stuck in hell, but there's a big part of your life being in hell. Yeah. But when, when would you ever be at your happiest? If you if you ever were happy? <laughs> Is there any moments? E yeah. I'm I'm getting there now, but it's like you said, you know, there's been, I've been on my own, you know, very silent, very, it, it's been very lonely as well because I ended up having l massive amounts of people and I've got rid of them all. Um, but <laughs> when will I be happy? I'll be happy when I get justice. On who? Those responsible for what they've done to me. And they have personally and the public need to know because I've got six and a half years of it. When I've got justice to those that directly have tried to destroy me and try to get rid of me like they had done previously. And those that have directly or indirectly done things to those that I love, then I'll be at peace whether that's in this country or whether it's in another country, I will get there. What's the biggest life lesson you've learned so far, Andy? Trust. I wrote, I wrote a book, Position of Trust. It's funny, 40% of it was taken out by legal reasons. But people can write their own biography and put in what they want. Trust. My book's called Position of Trust. I'd like to write another position of trust betrayed. For anybody watching that's maybe went through what you've went through as a young boy or a young girl, what advice would you have for them? My advice is those, and I, there is an army that have been abused that are still struggling, but are fighting like warriors to get justice. Those that have in them to do it because it's a huge thing because it can have a an effect on your short term but the long term 
will is worth it if they've got the the courage to speak because the police are under a lot of scrutiny at the moment at the moment for revealing these types of crimes to speak up um but when they speak up they need to be empowered to push because they will try and brush it under the carpet and those that can't are though come in that category where they're in fear of the family they're in fear of what it might happen to the livelihoods and it's each free will each individual has free will and that free will is is given to all people so who am i or to you or to anyone to say you should speak out for any parent that's watching it takes us onto football is there any telltale signs that you should be looking out for yeah the the main one it's like this is one of my bugbears with schools because they spend most of their time at school teachers see them you'll see a behavioral difference in a child no matter what age and it might be subtle but they should be trained to see that because it is there and there is a change it might be subtle but they will see a withdrawal quiet behavior change if it's instant then that something isn't right see that's the hard thing about kids because they go through all their hormones all they their do. changes periods they do puberty and you're probably just thinking ah just fucking teenager but yeah it's hard to think that you would miss something like I can't imagine what your parents have went through. Like, again, if your, your coach wants your yeah. fucking kid to stay over, that's a telltale sign to yeah, fuck yeah, off. Yeah, yeah. And also, I always say to people, if, you've, if your gut instinct, your stomach is your second brain, we have our mind, but we also have a second brain, and they always say go with your gut. If you have that gut feeling with somebody, whether they're asking to stay over or, or whatever it is, or someone isn't right, normally your gut's right. Yeah, because that Barry looked like a fucking sex case. He'd get his Jimmy Savile eyes. He's got the fucking eyes. Like the, they look, it's, it's sad because it, it must be difficult because Jimmy Savile's got photos with everybody. People yeah. probably thought, people may have heard the stories, but there will be innocent people who has got photos with him yeah, yeah. and thinking they can maybe enhance his career. But... There is a vibe. You look at them and you think, fucking, you shouldn't judge a book by its cover, but no. you fucking judge they bastards. But like, Jimmy yeah. Savile just looks like an out and out fucking nonce, man. Like, it maybe it'd been difficult if you're with him and yeah, maybe yeah, yeah. all the glitz and the glam and all yeah. the fucking the, the fame and whatever. Yeah. But there must have, because who was it exposed them? Fucking Johnny Rotten. Yeah. Done an interview or done a song mm. and they kind of shut him off, man, mm. and shut him down. But how he was in with the royalties. How he's cutting about with fucking the so-called king you now and cut, cutting about and Prince Andrew and you go. Epstein. Like, there, I've, how, got, I've it, got a lot of stuff on that stuff as well, which is another story, which again, it's that ring of steel. That mile, they call it the, 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 the square mile. The square mile is in London. There's a square mile in Washington. It goes a square mile ring of steel. So it's that, like a paedophile ring all around the world. But you look at Epstein Island, you look at, is that? Yeah. The Ellen DeGeneres show, she's got, so Epstein Island's got a blue and white building on her show, she's got that blue, exact same yeah. building behind her. Yeah. And all the shit that's coming out with them. Like oh, it's, it, I mean, we could have another uh, about stuff that I know about that and t teams that I'm involved with that are underground looking and are in the process of revealing something big that becomes draining though on yeah. your life because yes. it's as if you can never get away from it no. uh, but you're trying to do the right thing because the under, yeah. undercover paedophile guy came on and i questioned how could you do that job part of me was thinking yeah is it because it's an out and a, a, he can get away with seeing yeah. kids being abused and that's yeah. him getting his fix but yeah. he says to me as soon as I'd saved my first kid, how can I walk away? Yeah. Who else is going to do it? If yeah. You've saved a kid, James. Yeah. And you know what's going on. Do you just turn away and go, I can't do this anymore? Yeah. Help save hundreds of lives, man. Nothing Absolutely. but respect for the man. There's a, there's a team I'm engaged with. I'm helping, well, 
going to help in the future. And they're they're fantastic. They've got a hundred percent success rate in convictions, and they go, go out as teams and they're outing them. They're, they're they're literally doing it, and I applaud them because they're doing it ethically. They're linking with the police and they're doing it ethically, and they're outing the paedophiles. Yeah, good. I think on. it's brilliant what they're doing, and it's like you know with me in football, you know about truce. Yeah, I've, I've got I've got somebody in Ireland that has you know the power that they have. You know Manchester City, you know they they had a scheme set up and they accepted liability and stuff. But some some football clubs are actually bigger than that. You know it's like there was an article in the paper on the thirty first of March about. Um, Manchester United and a player and he came out and he was talking about what went on within that football club in the dressing rooms with Ryan Giggs and David May and there's an article out there so I can talk about it because it's it's been published and I know someone another connection that I've got in Ireland that's been trying to fight that for you know a long time and he just gets the door slammed in his face well why shouldn't the truth come out why? What's what? Why are they hiding it? Ryan Giggs is a proper fucking dirty bastard, man. He was shagging his his brother's wife while she was six months pregnant. You got it, dirty, dirty bastard. I was in I was in the same age group as him, and all of them. So I do know, and I also know also a lot more when I was growing up because we used to play against them all the time. You know, Irish players coming over, staying in digs. So why should, you know, they never featured, I never mentioned them, but the guy I know in Ireland, wow, he's been doing it for 20 odd years. 20 odd years of it, of evidence. Why does a high profile player get away with it then? Is football bigger than the law? Seems like it. Something's going on. Look at the shit that Alex Ferguson had. To, a lot of shit get exposed in Man U, but a lot of shit is still swept under the carpet. Like with football players, like you say, it's like they're on a pedestal. Yeah. They can get away with certain things. Look at the young kid. Who's it, Green? Where, what's the boy who raped the girl? She had the fucking blood and she had the video. Oh, yeah, Greenwood. Greenwood? Yeah. Blatant, bank your rights. Yeah. But he'll be playing football again soon. There's questions to be asked and, you know... I but could... you've still got to be... Allegations are allegations yeah, as well. I've course. had people who's had, I had more, uh, more Rami on there. Yeah. With Tommy Robinson both together. Mo was accused of child trafficking. Mm. The girl just got 12 years for lying. Yeah. That guy destroyed his, uh, destroyed that guy's life with the allegations because it, people yeah. shared his story all over Facebook. Bang, he was guilty. So I've had it. The young girl, there was a video of a girl hitting herself with hammers, blamed mm. the man, the man got three years as well. Yeah. And the video just came out that she was made it up. So Mo, his son nearly committed suicide because mm. his, your dad's basically called a fucking nun. So allegations are allegations. So they've are. still got to question everything just because there's a video. It could be fucking Absolutely. foreplay. It could be. But you name it. You still yeah. got to have an intuition. I got have your opinion, but you still got to question it. Innocent to proven guilty. But there's a lot of people there who's not had a guilty that are fucking guilty. So that's it's it. Just be careful with everything in question, everything in my eyes. Exactly. And I, I'm all about that. It's about balance and harmony, you know. And it's like with myself, you know, I got accused of something that I didn't do, which I proved. It didn't even go to court and it was never going to go to court because there was tel telephone evidence. It was everything. To, it was nailed down and it wasn't. But I've been accused of that. So I know from both sides of the balance of it, you know, and but in terms of evidence, evidence is evidence. Mm. And some people get off that. But I've been on both sides. So I do know. And it... When you are, you do have an allegation against you. And there's some, you know, Chad Evans, for instance, you know, he's he's one that ended up going to prison. But it's like, I've been on that receiving end. You know, it was all over the internet about me. They tried to ruin me, you know, my Twitter, you name it. It was everywhere about it. Because there was somebody that had set up a site who was trying to discredit me. Lo and behold, I know what his relationship was with the police. But he tried to do it. So I know what that feels like. Did it take me to suicide? Pfft. I was like, 
I might as well just call a day on this because I can't cope with this. This is affecting my family. This is affecting everyone around me and I'm innocent. So I know what that's like to, to have it splashed all over everywhere. I felt sick because I wanted to tell the truth, yet I was being advised by my agent, or well not agent, he was helping me, to go, no, don't say anything. Silence is bliss. Well, I want to tell the truth. And I've still not told the truth, but the truth will come out when I'm ready. What's the connection with Gary Speed? Can we talk about that? or? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, I can talk about Gary Speed because the police knew about it. Because in 2013, after it, it was 2014, I did a magazine article. I'm still in touch with the man who wants to do another one with me. Um, who did it? It was in a magazine. I think it was in the Daily Mail. And they'd been to see me and they asked me the direct question. And I was I was an undercover, well, not undercover, but a police officer who wasn't being named. And that was me. And Gary, unfortunately, you know, he, he was with Benel at the time before me, you know. And I'm not, I can't sit here and say 100% that, Gary took his life because of that because there's various other, various other factors with me as well when I was you know I've tried to k kill myself numerous times that I've I even put a pipe in my car and it didn't bloody work well that's I'm here for a reason do you know that's how I look at it now I look at my path and I wasn't meant to go uh, but Gary I can't say that that but there has to be some factor in that because he was he did stay at Benel's house and they questioned it on, I've Googled it, they questioned it. And it, it's hard for the family, like it has been for mine. Yeah, it's a difficult thing, man. And to think that young, tortured souls, as young, innocent kids just want to be footballers, being manipulated and groomed by a fucking out-and-out -out sex case, man, and yeah. destroys lives. It's a life sentence. He gets 36 years, but he'll get out. Yeah. You're still tortured to the day you fucking die. And the only reason yeah, you can is. really beat that is trying to get some closure, is trying to expose more names and bring yeah. light and try and help more kids who, yeah. for the voiceless, man, because people yeah. are scared. And I can I can understand why people don't speak out. No. I can understand. But look, there's people say, there's people come on here and says, look, they know so many pedophiles involved in football and TV. And people say, oh, fucking tell their names, this and that. It ain't as easy as just no. exposing names because, first no, of all, you're dead. <laughs> You become a threat to just fucking kill you off. Like, yeah. we, we know this now, this suicide yeah. shit. Like, <laughs> but it's difficult for people just to, because they've got kids, they've got other family people say, oh, we'll right. try and protect your own kids. But it's not as easy as that because your kids become a target. Your job becomes a target. Every, your other cousins, your, everybody becomes a target. Does. One big story in the newspapers can destroy your whole life. It can. And Completely. that's a scary thing. Completely. What's, uh, so we've spoke about plans for the future, but round it all off then, Andy, for yeah. us that, I think what I think it's all about, about why you're here today. Yeah, when when you're talking about the future as well, is is because I've although I'd done the book and the film, and that was purely for others. That was purely for others, and it and it always is. Um, and it I, I was I was silenced, silenced, and but I was in the background doing all that to help others. You know, me going forward for my future. Yeah, I want justice and I want your know, honesty to come out. But it's like I've done all all the interviews around the world, and I've, I did I did the public speaking in Brazil. You know, I did it at Palmeiras and Santos. And they're not small clubs, and there was a lot. Well, I was doing every interview with all the television programs and stuff. But that's my that's my forte in future, and I was going to do it a few years back. But the, I mean, quite a lot of them jumped on it, and they've done it with the FA. But I didn't want to do that. I wanted to do it independently, and. I'm a natural speaker and I, and I, and I, and I want to encourage and do this moving forward and I will do it and I will speak in public. I can do it in front of thousands or 10 people, but if it helps another person, then that's what I want to do moving forward. But I've just not been ready for that because too much has happened. Like you said, it's like, a, it's like a film the last six years, but going forward, I want to do that. You know, to see all these Ted talks and them stand up there and, talk about mental health and well-being and talk about the life when we talk about my life and i'm still sat here empowered and strong to stand up to these institutes people whatever and speak a truth and say this can happen to me 
And I'm sat here now, still wanting to say, tell the truth and still standing up to them. Anybody can do it. And that's what I want to do moving forward. Talk. Yeah. Would you like to finish up on anything, Andy? I don't think so. Um, I, I've got a lot more to say. Um, but I think, you know, the essence of what's happened to me, I think I've, I've touched on, as you say, touched on. Um, but I've got a lot more to say. And I say that, and, and regardless of any, you know, future podcasts, which I hope I can do, but even if, if not, then there's nothing going to stop me getting this out. Fair play, man. Fair play for coming to the forefront and opening a fucking box. Uh, just madness, but gives people the strength to come forward as well. And yeah. The, the torture soul and the life's ruined is is unbelievable and obviously it'll go goes a lot more deeper that wouldn't say we're in the know but we know a lot of people who's been through it and we've yeah. spoke about it and it's sad man because we want the world to be all peaceful and beautiful and all love but <laughs> the bottom line is the world doesn't like that and yeah. all we can do is try and be better than we were yesterday and i've never been through what you've been through so i can't really understand it but when you've spoke to people from mm. who's speaking out about it i I, I get the just of it, but I don't. I, yeah. I can't imagine what your mind goes through. I've been through it. I've seen a lot of dark shit myself, and yeah. done a lot of bad shit myself. But to go through that as a kid, yeah, I, I, I genuinely don't know what words that I could ever put to try and make anybody feel at ease. My job is only to try and give people a voice, and mm. other people can maybe get strength and try and do the right thing and, and get as many of these fucking predators off the street. Yeah, possible. definitely. And you know, for me, just finishing off, it's like, you know it's about empowerment and I, you know, Kelly used to have a saying and I stick by it. Nobody can do this on their own. And there is light and dark in this world. And the dark has overshadowed the light with, with their power, with their empowerment, with their rituals, with their cults, with whatever you want to call it. But there comes a point in this world and through generations that there has to be, the light has to shine through and shine bright. But you can't do that until you've got like-minded souls collaborating together to change the world. And I do see around the world that people are, st are starting to stand up. And I do believe that the future is light. It's going to go through some more dark, but I do believe that the light will always shine in the future. Hopefully so, Andy. Andy, yeah. listen, God bless you, mate, and I wish God you all the best you. for the future. All right, you. cheers. Thank you.